In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be explaining how you can make tactics. Now, this is a broad subject. There's so many areas you can cover. But what I want to do is break all of these down to smaller little chapters so that it's easier for you guys to watch videos that are shorter instead of having to sit through a 45 minute video. No one wants to do that. And that's my plan. Now, if there are areas that you want to see me cover in a bit more detail, just drop me a note in the description below and we will be doing those shows. We're going to kick things off with something that some people might think is a bit more advanced. But actually, well, to be honest, space is the final frontier. So corny. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. I swear I shouldn't have done that. No, no, space is such an important concept in football that when people start saying it's an advanced concept and you shouldn't be talking about it, I disagree because it's just like chess. You need to understand the areas of the pitch you have to control. If you don't, then whenever you make a tactic, you won't even understand uh, whether you, you, you're doing well. You, know, you, you won't be able to identify your transitions. So on today's show, we're going to just break and explain shape, right? So I'm going to break it all down, explain shape, um, overloads, golden zones, why some teams like to control this side of the pitch a bit more, explain this little concept so that, you know, we set the stage for the rest of the videos to follow. And if you're interested in these kind of videos, don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe button. Please follow me. And yes, feel free to ask questions along the way so that this little series of videos can be helpful for you. My name, my name, my name is Daljit. Welcome to the show. When we talk about football, Anybody talks about football, they'll talk about defending, you know, the team was able to defend their third or, you know, consolidate midfield really well. They were controlling midfield, um, you know, they were doing overloads. But in order for us to understand all this, we need to be able to break the pitch down into some manageable chunks so that we can define areas of the pitch. I mean, I mean, when somebody talks about an overload, where is the overload happening? I mean, if you don't even know where the overload is happening, you won't even understand where to look. So we have to talk about transitions first as moving the ball from one end of the pitch to the other to the other end of the pitch. Jose Mourinho, Pep Guardiola, all the managers, every single manager in the game talks about transitions, moving the ball from one end of the pitch to the other end of the pitch. At its very basic level, we can break the pitch up into three parts, the lower third, middle third, and the upper third. Teams. You will see teams trying to control the middle third a lot because this is where the midfield battle happens. Teams will be trying to make sure that they can defend the lower third as well. And some teams might give up space on the flanks, defend the center, right? And launch counter attacks, hoping to take advantage of any defenders that are not defending their own third. So we have to be able to identify transitions because when you have the ball, you'll be moving the ball from one end of the pitch to the other end of the pitch. You might start in the lower third, you consolidate your transition in the middle third, which literally means you're getting your players in, you're moving the ball around, you're controlling midfield before you attack a team in the final third or the upper third. Then the conversation will shift to something called the half space. Yes, um, the half space is a recent thing that's happened in football uh, when teams talk about controlling certain zones on the pitch. Now, why is the half space so important? Because simply put, a player can see more of the pitch when he's standing in the half space, allowing him to control that area of the pitch more effectively. Some coaches will put a player here and another player here to control both these, these sides of the pitch very effectively. Sides like... Manchester City will typically have a winger standing in this zone and one fullback controlling this area of the pitch so that they can control this zone very, very effectively. Another reason why half spaces are so important is because the half space straddles zone 14. Zone 14 is the area where a lot of assists can be generated. So teams typically try to attack this area, control this area and try and unlock space by moving defenders into the half space, freeing up zone 14 for them to, you know, apply pressure and create assists. Some attacking teams like to apply pressure. This is an example of an overload being applied to 
one side of the pitch where it straddles the half zone and part of the golden zone. By doing this, what a team is doing is they are forcing more of the opposition players to enter this, this zone, which is the overload zone. What this will end up doing is creating 1v1 chances on the other side because on this side, you might have a player who's in a wider position and somebody else who's in the half space. Both of these players will be able to create 1v1 chances against the opposition coming in on the blind side to score. How many times have you conceded goals on the far post? Of course, there are other kinds of overloads too. This, this is an overload happening down a flank where you might be using wingers, you might be using fullbacks, you might be using more rolls down the flanks to unlock space in the middle of the pitch. Pulling a team to one side of the pitch to create space in the center and down the flank. And overload is something that we are always trying to look out for in the game. It's important to understand overloads because we are always trying to look for the overload. We are always trying to identify how the opposition is trying to attack us. It's something I do in every single game. I might look at a highlight from the opposition to identify their attacking patterns. When a team tries to attack me centrally, I know they're trying to overload the middle. Then what I can do is I can congest that space with players, maybe adding one or two DMs to that space and then making it harder for them to find players they can pass the ball to. When teams are trying to apply the overload down the flanks, then I have to be more concerned about the delivery of crosses into the box. I might want to shut down the delivery of crosses or I might want to be very careful about trying to spot cutbacks because sometimes these players might be going down the flanks doing an overload on that side of the pitch trying to pull players there before they do a cutback across the face of goal for a midfielder to arrive late to score the goal. So here, understanding how teams are attacking space forms the bedrock of any strategy when you want to create any kind of a tactic. The first part is relatively easy, right? Shape. But it's the second part that can be a challenge. Now, in order for us to make it easier, all we got to do is try and understand our team so that we can understand how they will control the space. In order for that to work, we need to break our team down into um, a set of core attributes so that we can understand them a bit better. We're going to break these down broadly into two areas, footballing intelligence and physical attributes. For footballing intelligence, we're looking at several attributes, anticipation, concentration, decisions, bravery, positioning or off the ball. These drive a player's footballing intelligence. Then we've got physical attributes. These are going to be acceleration, jumping reach, stamina and work rate. So why break the attributes down in such a way? Well, simply put, this will allow us to decide what kind of formations we're going to use, whether we want to use bottom heavy formations because our players may not be that good at controlling space or uh, our players are so good that we can afford to just play with two defenders and send the rest up in attack. Before we begin any exercise, we have to benchmark our team to find out how well we've, we fare against the rest of the league. Our jumping reach is the worst in the land. It's 11.46, 20th in this area. Uh, SI haven't fixed this yet, so we don't know what the highest benchmark is. But to make things a lot easier for you guys, I'm just going to give you a heads up. Uh, if you are expecting to compete in the Champions League and do well, or maybe even lift the title in your own land, everything has got to be 15, right? For the, the highest league in the land, right? And then what you do from that point onwards is you minus one for every league you are in, right? So if you, uh, Premiership is 15. If you're the Championship, 14. If you're in League One, it's 13. So you work your way down like that and that makes it a bit easier. Now, another way of doing this is probably going out there to uh, scout the best team in the land. Uh, you just, in this particular case, it's supposed to be Serie A, uh, Serie A and Juventus. Then you just go and scout um, Juventus and find out what their tallest defenders are like and what the strikers are like. You need to find out both and then you can, you know, and it's a lot of work, so I just made it easier for you just, you know, start with 15. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have already done our benchmark. The attribute number to beat is 15. Then I'm looking at my defenders. I've got two defenders here, Lianco and Bremer. Jumping reach 14 and 15, but positioning 13 and 13. Immediately, the first one in my mind is they need help. They need a DM. Concentration is also 12 and 12 which means that, you know, they might get pulled out of position. A DM is definitely a, a viable option for them. If I play with a 
just a DM at the back. Maybe I can't have my fullbacks bombing up the pitch so often so that we can defend the flanks too. So a narrow attack, a narrow defensive width might be a problem for this team. So this is how you want to be looking at analyzing your team. This makes it easier for you to decide what kind of formations might come in handy. The next thing we want to do is look at applying the same metric with uh, defensive midfielders, right? Are our defensive midfielders able to help these players out? So we go to our defensive midfielders and we look at the same thing. Anticipation, concentration, decisions, bravery. Now we're looking at bravery as well. So we've got two players here we can't really depend on. So this guy is not going to be much use to us defensively because he's got low bravery. Then we're looking at players who can read the game. There are not too many players whose anticipation is very good. And concentration is also pretty average. Only two players stand out. These two players and perhaps Sasa Lukic, who's a central midfielder, and Thomas Rincon, who's another central midfielder. So we've got defensive midfielders that can read the game really well and have decent decision-making. They're not the best in the land, but pretty average. Positioning-wise, well, they, they aren't the best again, but now we have, an extra, we have extra players, right? We have players who have decent positioning, who can help us on the flanks. They may not have to be the best, but added numbers that just makes it a bit more harder for better teams to penetrate those half spaces or and take advantage or create overloads down one side of the pitch. You can't win a title if you can't defend well. So today's episode is meant to be simple. Space and how we can defend our own third. And that's why we started the show like this. On future episodes, I will talk about how we can attack space but meanwhile, back here, right now, with this team, Torino, we understand that the defenders aren't the best. They're an average team. So perhaps they're playing Liverpool next. If we were playing a really good team, then perhaps the best approach would be to have a formation like this, which makes it hard for teams who are very attacking to exploit the space behind our lines very easily forcing them into congested areas, making them vulnerable to the counter-attack. This is the reason why when I talk about creating tactics, the very first video has to be about shape. But we want to keep it simple because we want to lay the foundations for future shows we do on the channel where I talk about creating tactics, how we're going to create overloads down one side of the pitch, whether or not we want to brute force our way down one side of the pitch or whether we want to overload one side of the pitch or whether we want to draw a team up because these are all broad strategies on how you can use space on the pitch. However, we can't go there without understanding our players first, which is why we have to look at footballing intelligence and certain physical attributes to understand how those players can control space. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's short episode on space and you found it useful. Now, don't forget, there are going to be more episodes like this coming up very soon. So you may want to just follow this channel, stay notified. And if you have more questions about space and how we can use this to create tactics, please drop me a note below and ask me away. You can follow me on Twitter at BusterNet as well. Or just, you know, hop on Discord and just carry the conversation. We've already kickstarted this on Discord. So yeah feel free to keep asking me questions now if you want to join our discord channel now if you're a youtube member you automatically get invited or you can just become a patron of the channel and you get an invitation to our discord channel as well i want to thank everybody for their support of the channel in one way or another keep those questions coming you are helping help others as well right so every time you ask a question you know it triggers something in my head about the next video that i want to do so you guys take care have a good one and have a very happy new year. Bye-bye.